everyone here. Uh, it's a great privilege to have you here for our study in Romans. And uh, who was that just popped in? Book TV, welcome to you. Uh, I was just rereading my notes and I reread what I wrote at the beginning. I want you to listen to these words. We are no longer in the condition of being crushed under the weight of the law, no longer oppressed by its burden of guilt and judgment. We are no longer under the law as guilty people, for we are righteous in Christ. I just, I don't know. I just, I just made this. I would encourage you to, to take this, to print it out and put it on your mirror, put it where you can read it every day and understand who Christ has made you to be. We are no longer crushed. We are no longer condemned. Welcome, Michaela. Glad you could make it again. We're just getting started. So welcome to our Bible study. That's just a great saying. And our format today, again, will be worship and prayer, study, comments, and questions. And we have may, may have heard this song before, but it bears repeating because it goes along with our theme from Romans where we are in chapter 6. So let's listen to the song. And when you are done, please type done into the room. <laughs> 
love that song and <laughs> and if it's a pirate song so be it it's a great song well let us pray before we begin gracious heavenly father we thank you gracious God, that we are not crushed under the weight of sin, that you have provided a way for us to be reconciled to our Father. And that is through your atoning sacrifice, through your righteousness, through your good works that we could not accomplish in this lifetime. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Father, we ask you to open your word to us that we may know you better and that we may love you more in jesus name amen amen thank you so our scripture today we are still in romans chapter six paul is going to ask us a couple of questions here he says what then are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace in other words, if we're not crushed under the weight of sin, are we then to go ahead and sin? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart. Very, very important phrase there. We have become obedient from the heart. Why? Because God has given us a new heart. We have been, become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and have been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Amen. Uh, I want to relate to you a, a story of a man named uh, Thomas Cramner. Uh, in the center of Oxford, England, there stands one of the oldest churches in that country, and on a pillar near the pulpit is a small plaque commemor commemorating those who were martyred by Queen Mary in the street outside the church. Now, if you've ever heard of Queen Mary, yeah, her uh, name at that time, they called her Bloody Mary because of all the sacrifices or the, the martyrs that she murdered. One of the most powerful accounts is that of Thomas Cramner, who has had been the Archbishop of Canterbury when Henry VIII had been alive. He supported a uh, Henry's, if you know the story, Henry broke away from the Catholic Church and he provided much of the theology that let Henry justify his rejection of the Pope's rule over the church. But when Bloody Mary or Queen Mary came to the throne, she insisted that Cranmer and other church leaders denounce the Protestant faith and write a letter of submission to the Pope. Now, Mary did not believe his letter was sincere, so she made him sign it in public on the floor of the church in Oxford. But in the end, he refused. And the historical record in the archives at Windsor report his words. These are Cramner's very words. I have sinned in that I signed with my hand what I did not believe with my heart. When the flames are lit, this hand shall be the first to burn. He was led outside, tied to a stake above a pyre of hay and wood. When the fire was lit around his feet, he leaned forward. He held his right hand in the fire until it was charred into a stump. Aside from this, he did not speak, he did not move, except that once he raised his left hand to wipe the sweat from his forehead. Now what an extreme example of an extreme choice, but a choice that in many ways is the perfect context for our study today. I wanted us to think about our freedom to choose. 
the detail and the depth of our choices we make and the importance of that freedom in the covenant we have with God our Father through Jesus Christ our Savior. Think of the choices that we make every day, the little ones, the big ones. We've been talking about justification now. Justification, that is God's legal declaration that we are righteous in his sight by the imputation of the merit, the works of Jesus Christ to our records establishes our heavenly citizenship and it guarantees our eternal life. We don't have to wait for eternal life to start because it already has started. We have now eternal life in Christ Jesus. That is what our justification has accomplished. However, justification is not the entirety of our salvation, which also encompasses the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In other words, those who have been justified begin to serve God truly, but this service is never the basis for our right standing with our Creator. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, Free will I have often heard of, but I have never seen it. I have met with will, and plenty of it, but it has either been led captive by sin or held in blessed bonds of grace. So the choice is not, should I give up my freedom so that I can submit to God? Rather, it is, should I serve sin or should I serve God? We have to serve someone. We always serve someone. So Paul is bringing out a main point in this scripture today. Either you are a slave to sin resulting in death or you are a slave to obedience resulting in righteousness. And I like to put an adjective in front of obedience. I like to use the word joyful obedience. It is joyful obedience to serve Christ. So either you're a slave of sin or you're a slave of obedience. There's no two ways about it. So clearly Paul's theme is slavery. The words slave or enslaved occur four times in these verses that I've read today. Also, the word obedience, obedient, or obey occurs four times. And so the issue here is whose slave are you? Do you obey sin? Do you obey God? There are no other options. So let's work through our text. And as we work through our text, I'm going to bring up Three points. Amen. I like that, Daniel. When God saved the Hebrews, he said, let my people go. Why? So that they might worship me. Good point. Yes. So the first point we're going to take a look at is if you think that being under grace means that you are free to sin, then you do not understand grace. Paul says, what then? He's asking a hypothetical question. Are we to sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? By no means. So Paul is, is responding to a potential critic who would abuse his statement that he said, you are not under law, but under grace. The critic would say, well, if we're not under law, but under grace, then we're free to sin without worry of condemnation. So in this case, we don't sin so that may, grace may abound, but rather because grace has replaced the law. But Paul responds, as he did in verse 2, with the strongest possible condemnation, by no means. As I said last week, the subject of law and grace is one of the most difficult theological issues in the Bible to understand, but it is often been taken to two extremes that we must avoid. On the one hand, some have feared that if we emphasize God's grace too much, people will fall into sin and licentiousness. And so they virtually put people back under the law by emphasizing rules for what they consider to be holy living. 
Often, these are not biblical commands, but rather conservative cultural norms or man-made rules propped up by Bible verses taken out of context. Invariably, legalists do not focus on sins of the heart, such as pride or lack of God, love for God, but rather on outward sins that we can see and sins that can be easily judged. The Pharisees and the Judaizers were the leading proponents of this false superficial spirituality. Yes, it's their own rules. On the other hand of the spectrum are those who have concluded, well, I'm not under law, I'm under grace, then sin doesn't matter. These folks view God as a loving, tolerant, nice old guy in the sky who would never judge anyone. So they mistake grace to mean that God is not concerned about our sin, which then leads to licentiousness, to open rebellion against God. So it's important to understand that God's true grace is not the balance point between legalism and licentiousness. Rather, legalism and licentiousness are two sides of the same coin whose operating principle is the flesh. The legalist acting in the flesh takes pride in his religious practices. He condemns those who do not match up to his standards of righteousness while he congratulates himself, pats himself on the back for, for his outstanding performance. He imagines that by keeping the law, he could commend himself to God, but he's operating in the flesh. He's not examining his heart before God, and it's obvious that the licentious person is operating in the flesh, giving in to the lust of the flesh, and justifying it by equating grace with tolerance for sin. So both legalism and licentiousness stem from the sinful flesh. God's grace is opposed to both of these, not as their balance point, but as a completely different way of relating to God. As we've seen, preaching God's grace always exposes us to the charge of licentiousness from the legalist. Look, it even happened to, to Jesus himself. Look what happened in Luke chapter 5. And Levi made him a great feast in the house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at this compute at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And if it happened to Jesus, it will happen to us. But those making the charge do not understand grace at all, as Paul's strong reaction shows by no means. So if we have responded to the good news that God freely justifies the ungodly sinner through faith alone, apart from works, then we will hate the sin that put our Savior on the cross. We are identified with him in his death to sin and identified with him in his resurrection to new life. That new life of Christ within us, it will manifest itself in obedience to God. I love that. Uh, grace has taught my heart to fear. It has. Grace is an unending abundance of grace working in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits, and enabling us to love and to obey our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look what the Apostle John says. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has 
been born of God. So as Paul shows, lawlessness is the mark of a slave of sin. Righteousness is the mark of one who has received God's abundant grace. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and so you can test yourself by this. Let me get some water a second. Okay, I think I'm back. If you think that being under grace means that you are free to sin, or that you can just shrug off your sin as no big deal, you do not understand God's grace. If motivated by God's love and grace in giving his son, you now hate and you fight your sin and you strive to be more obedient, then you understand grace. God's grace is powerful. It instructs us and it trains us. Let's look at this. What Paul said in Titus, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us. Look at that word, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Psalmist, I think you and I have our wavelengths going on the same thoughts. Good thinking. God's sovereign purpose in calling us out of the world and commanding his people to live righteousness righteously to provide the witness that brings God's plan and purpose of salvation to fulfillment. Paul wants us to make sure that we understand that the proper result of God's grace is to make us slaves of righteousness, not slaves of sin. We are no longer slaves of sin. Which brings us to our point two. In verse 16, Paul says, do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So there's only two options here. You give yourself to be a slave of sin, resulting in death, or you give yourself to be a slave of obedience, resulting in righteousness. Paul again appeals to knowledge, in this case, the common knowledge of a general example. In that culture, sometimes a man had to sell himself into slavery because of financial troubles. Once you did that, you were the slave of the one that you sold yourself to, and you had to obey him as your master. Paul's point here, though, is not so much the slave had to obey his master, but rather that the master you obey shows whose slave you really are. In other words, you were identified with that particular master. In like manner, if you obey sin, it shows you that you're a slave of sin headed towards eternal death. If you obey God, it shows that you are his slave resulting in righteousness. If there is a change of masters, you then obey your new master. Does that make sense? You once were a slave of a different master, but God has transferred you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. And now Christ is your master. So he is the master you obey, and that shows whose slave you now are. Paul next takes 
uses obedience because he wants to make it clear that not being under the law does not in any way imply that we are free to sin. Being under grace means that we present ourselves as slaves for obedience to God. This me, obedience, and let me stress this point, we're talking about obedience, but this obedience is not the means to salvation, but rather the result of salvation. Thus, while slavery to sin leads to death, slavery to obedience leads to righteousness. We are not saved by our obedience, but rather we are saved by faith that results in a lifetime of obedience. And I already know what Psalmist is thinking. I know you're going to put that verse up. <laughs> For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And here's the verse. For we are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece, another translation says, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we are not saved by works. We are saved unto good works. So it's very clear. Either Christ is your master and you obey him, or sin is your master and you obey it. There's no middle ground. You can't keep one foot on the dock and the other foot in the boat. Either you're a slave of obedience to Christ or you're a slave of sin. You can't have Christ and sin as your master. Now, if that sounds extreme, keep in mind that Paul is merely echoing the teaching of Jesus himself. No one can serve two masters. Now, now Jesus is using the example of money, but it still applies to this verse. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Or mammon. Later in Matthew, Jesus said that there are two and only two gates, the narrow gate that leads to life and the broad gate that leads to destruction. There are two types of trees, the good tree that bears good fruit and the bad tree that bears bad fruit. There are two kinds of builders who build two kinds of houses. Wise builders build on the rock. Foolish builders build on the sand. The wise builders represent those who hear Jesus' words and obey them. The foolish builders hear his words but do not obey. Thus, everybody serves somebody or something. Some of you may remember that old song by, by Bob Dylan. <laughs> you got to serve someone. Some of us, some of you younger folk here might not remember that, but he said, you may serve the devil or you may serve the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. <laughs> We're all going to serve somebody or something. Everybody serves somebody. You can, you can tell who a person serves by his behavior or actions. Those who live in sin are the slaves of sin. Those who live in obedience are the slaves of Jesus Christ. Those who are slaves of sin are not under grace and are headed towards eternal death. Those who are slaves of Christ have tasted his grace, are growing in righteousness, and are heading for eternal life. Now, the question is, how does a person move from being a slave of sin to being a slave of God and righteousness. Well, point three will explain that. And here's point three. The only way that you can change from being a slave of sin to being a slave of righteousness is for God to free you from sin by changing your heart. Paul goes on in verses 17 and 18. He says, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Paul here describes that great change that came over the Roman believers when God saved them. 
These changes are true for everyone whom God has saved. They are radical changes, not minor changes. From being slaves of sin, they became obedient from the heart to sound doctrinal teaching. From being in bondage to sin, they were freed to become slaves of righteousness. Thus, there was a change of lordship from Satan's domain of sin to God's domain of righteousness. There was a change of thinking so that now we, they, submit to biblical truth. There was a change of heart so that we are now willing, we are glad slaves of God. They love him. They hate their former master. There was a change of will so that now they obey God's standards of righteousness and not sin. And there was a change of desire because it is now our desire to serve God because we love him and we want to become like him. And we don't want to be conformed to this world, but we want to be transformed. Yes, he promised that new heart, that heart of flesh that he will give you. And he promised in Deuteronomy 30 to circumcise your heart. And the heart of your offspring, that's very important there in that Deuteronomy passage. It's to you and your children that you and your children will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Jeremiah 31, for this is the covenant it's God's covenant. Remember, who is the covenant keeper? God is the covenant keeper. He makes it. He keeps it. He enables us to serve him. That I will make with the house of Israel. I will be their God. There's your Emmanuel principle, if you remember that. I'll give you four quick thoughts in these last few verses. First off, salvation is neither a human project nor a joint human divine project. Rather, salvation is totally of the Lord. Slaves of sin are not able to free themselves by their own efforts. Sure, unbelievers, oh, you know, they can quit things. I can quit, you know, if I'm an unbeliever, I can, by sheer willpower, I, I can quit smoking or drinking or whatever I'm doing or sinning or I can quit those things but it's usually for selfish purposes. In fact, slaves of sin most often do not realize that they are slaves of sin, and they would resent anyone telling them that they are. Jesus told the Jews that the truth would make them free. They responded that they had never been enslaved to anyone. Now think of that. Think of the irony of that. How soon they forgot the Egyptian captivity. How soon they forgot the Babylonian captivity. How soon they forgot they were even slaves in the Roman Empire as they said those words. So Paul uses the passive verb, having been set free from sin, to show that God alone can free us and has, in fact, already in the past freed us. We are saved because God chose us as weak foolish, lowly, and despised sinners so that he might shame the world's wise, mighty, and exalted so that no one may boast before the Lord. Salvation is totally God's doing, not ours. But second point up above, the way God changes us is by bringing our mind, our heart, and will into submission to his word. And when does the person know they are deceived? That's exactly right. They're deceived because they don't know that they are deceived. God has to reveal that to their hearts, that they are deceived and come to the way of truth. So he changes our mind, our heart, and our will. God changes us by bringing our minds under the teaching of his word. The truth of the matter is that sound doctrine will always lead to godly behavior. But not only this, because God changes our hearts, he even changes our desires. We must understand the truth with our minds and also our hearts, but we must rejoice in and willingly embrace the truth. The evidence of this change of mind and heart is that our wills gladly obey the truth. To be obedient from the heart is not grudging outward 
obedience, but cheerful inner obedience. It is obedience on the heart level where God alone sees not outward obedience to impress others without spirit, showing others how spiritual we are. The third thought that Paul has here. The teaching is not committed to the Christians, but rather the Christians are committed to the teaching. We don't sit in judgment of the word, but the word sits in judgment on us. A person who has come under God's grace and Christ submit to God, God's word. God brings us to the point that we have a teachable spirit and a teachable mind to hear the word, to receive the word, to act upon the word, and then to obey the word. It changes us. It transforms us. It corrects us. It reproves us. And then the fourth point above, when God saves you, he frees you from sin and makes you a slave of righteousness. So either you are enslaved to sin or you are enslaved to righteousness. This is true for all Christians. It is not just true of some Christians who have had a dramatic spiritual experience to free them from sin. It is true of all who used to be in Adam, but now you are in Christ. You have been freed from sin and you have become slaves of righteousness. Now, this does not mean that we have become sinlessly perfect. Neither does it mean that we are free from the old sin nature, the old man, the old flesh, so to speak, or that we will never be tempted by sin. Rather, it means that the power of sin over us has been broken so that we no longer live under sin as our master. We do not obey sin as the normal course or practice of our daily lives. Rather, we now obey righteousness. That means we have come under the power and control and influence of righteousness. Formerly, we served sin. We obeyed its desires, its urges. But now we serve righteousness. We obey God and his word. The irony is that true freedom is not freedom to sin. Rather, true freedom is slavery to God and his righteousness. We are now free to serve God. How about that? We are grateful for this gift. Amen. Amen. Let me just relate, just to close out a story. I read a story about a, a bazaar in a village in India. A farmer had bought a, a covey of quail. Each bird had a string tied around its foot with the other end tied to a ring on an upright stick. You can kind of picture this little quail walking around in circles, couldn't go anywhere because he was tied to the, to the string, which was then tied to the stick. So you get the picture. The quail, all of the quail walked around and around in a circle held captive by the string. No one wanted to buy any of the quail and until a devout Hindu came along, his religious respect for all of life and his compassion for these birds led him to ask, what is the price of the quail? Then he said to the merchant, I want to buy them all. And after he paid the money, he ordered the merchant, now set them all free. The merchant was surprised, but the, the Hindu insisted, cut the strings and set them all free. The farmer cut the strings, but guess what? The quail kept marching around and around in a circle. Finally, he had to pick them up and shoo them off, but even then, they landed a short distance away and resumed marching in a circle, as they had done when they were tied to the stick. Think of it. God did not free you from sin so that you would keep going around and around in the same circles as you were when you were bound to sin. He freed you from sin so that you would become a slave of righteousness to him, resulting in obedience. 
You've got to serve somebody. The question is, and we must all ask this, are we serving sin? Are we serving God? And I don't want to be a quail either. And we do. We do that to ourselves. So again, let me put this up. Again, I will ask you if you want to take that graphic there, print it out, hang it in several places in your in your room with you, wherever you are. We are no longer in the condition of being crushed under the weight of the law, no longer oppressed by its burden of guilt and judgment. We are no longer under the law as guilty people, for we are righteous in Christ. Amen? That is our message. That is the message of the cross. And I will give credit where credit is due. I got that quote from Ligonier, one of their teachings. So I'm going to play a couple songs for you, and I will close us out in prayer. Uh, let me see. I can get this up here. I think, uh, violinist, I think you played this last night, and I thought this was appropriate for me to play as well. I will play Immortal, Invisible, and some of you might know a, a scripture song uh, called, um, that I will play after I finish that. We'll rejoice in the Lord at the end and sing hallelujah to the Lord. So I'll play those two songs for you, and then I'll close this in prayer. sing hallelujah to the Lord for his gracious goodness. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, that we are no longer slaves to sin, that we have been declared righteous in your sight. And Father, that you have enabled us through your Holy Spirit to be obedient, to serve you as your slave, as you are our master our King, our Savior, and our great and gracious Redeemer.
help us to remember that we are not quails walking around in circles, that we are no longer slaves of sin, that we, you have freed us to choose righteousness. Be glorified in us today. Strengthen us, and we give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here, and may God bless the rest of your day. Take care.